And we're back. Welcome, everyone, to today's ReadZ Live. Uh, my name is Martin. I'm part of the ReadZ team based here in London, and I'm very happy to welcome you to uh, ReadZ Live, our ongoing series of webinars where we bring on people from the world of publishing to show you how to write, publish better books. Uh, today, uh, we're returning to the well that is the memoir, uh, writing about your own life and turning it into a compelling story that people will want to read. Uh, my guest today is Jodie Fodor. Uh, she's an editor based in Santa Monica who had the good fortune of meeting while she was in London recently. Uh, so it's probably the first guest we've ever had that I've actually met in real life, uh, which is a novelty. Uh, while we wait for Jodie to come on, why don't you let us know where you're from uh, and tell us, yeah, are you in the middle of writing a memoir? Do you wish to write a memoir? Or are you just here purely out of curiosity? Uh, just having a look through, uh, we see Verna from uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, we have Jackie from Hampshire, uh, Lorna from London, uh, Dee from Hillsborough, uh, North Carolina. Fantastic. Ooh, Bakersfield, California. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Yvonne uh, from the traditional land of the Illini, um, between the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. Fantastic. That's a, that's a kind of specificity we like uh, in personal details. Uh, but cool. Well, we're just going to be a few minutes before Jody comes on to join us. I thought I might as well turn up uh, and say hello. If you're not familiar with Readsy, we're a marketplace that connects uh, writers such as yourself, hopefully, uh, with some of the best publishing talent in the world. That includes editors, that includes uh, marketers and book cover designers. Uh, if you're looking for the people who can help you put out a better book, uh, they're right here in Readsy. If you haven't signed up already, you can set up a free account and check out all the great people uh, we have on Readsy. Uh, including Jody, our guest for today. Uh, let's see who else is here. Anthony James uh, is writing a travel humor romantic uh, type of memoir. Fantastic. Uh, Kathy, uh, a nomadic van dweller, uh, living van life, writing chapters that may someday be a memoir. Fantastic. You're mining the uh, the the golden ore, uh, I guess, uh, ready to refine later. Uh, we have. Uh, Oh, uh, Sia Savi, uh, one of our regulars, asking, uh, am I doing nano? I'm not doing nano this year. Uh, I'm a bit uh, on, on the busy side. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if you are doing NaNoWriMo, the National Novel Writing Month, uh, where you are challenged to write 50,000 words between the beginning of November and the end of the month, uh, then good on you. Let, let us know how you're doing. We've got a, a lot of people who are traditionally nano or rhymers, as they call themselves uh, here in Reedsy. Um, we're always happy to see uh, folks succeed in that. Uh, Anne, writing about a computer career spanning 65 to 75. That's exciting. Kit from California, writing a memoir about being a speech therapist in Alaska for 31 years. Wow, this is good stuff. Uh, Irma from Miami, writing a memoir. Fantastic. Uh, and the mysterious of the freelance editor has edited dozens uh, of several different POVs. Fantastic. Okay, well, uh, while we're waiting, uh, I could... Uh, ask you a, a bit of a favor. Uh, if you haven't already, if you could like this video, it'll help us uh, quite a bit to uh, get this thing seen. I really appreciate uh, everyone who signed up, uh, but uh, if you just give us a like, and if you haven't already, um, why not uh, subscribe to our channel? We have these live events every few weeks, as well as new videos being posted by Shaylin, who's on our team. Uh, if you're interested, Shaylin is running a webinar next week uh, where she'll be doing one of her write-ins. The idea of that is that you tune in with your work in progress. She'll give you a bit of a talk with our other writer, Claire Batra, and uh, they'll set like a timer, and then you have 15 minutes, and then everybody writes in silence. So if you like tuning in to a live stream where people are silent for extended periods of time, then uh, you're in for a right treat next week. Uh, okay, we have Marvi, author of The Visa Saga. Sounds like a memoir, potentially. Uh, Joanna, uh, writing about her experience with a dot-com startup during the web boom. Very exciting. Uh, wow, so many people, fantastic, good to see so many faces, new names, uh, old names, uh, really happy. Uh, great, uh, well, I think it's starting to come to 7 o'clock for me here in the UK, uh, which means it's noon where our host, is, uh, our guest is, 3pm, I think, over in New York. Before I bring it on, i got to tell you, the clocks weren't back here last week, uh, but not in the States, which meant that figuring out the time zones for everybody was like a bit of a nightmare, especially when I think Australia, if anyone's in Australia, they've got like different uh, time zones and they've got different daylight savings there. Anyway, it was not fun. I had a bit of a brain freeze. 
Uh, but I think I got the dates all right and got the times all right. Anyhow, uh, it is now on the hour. Let me bring on my guest, uh, Jody Fodor. Jody, how are you doing? Hey, Martin. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, it's been well, almost a month since we uh, met in a pub in London. We, we met in a fantastic pub in London, thanks to you. But uh, yeah, good times, good times. Uh, yeah, like a, I don't really get the opportunity to meet too many of the editors here at Reedsy face to face. So uh, it was good to uh, be able to uh, actually, you know, get get the uh, real nitty gritty, get the real truth, the stuff that you can't share online. <laughs> we can't share online today. <laughs> and more and more truth as the as the beer flowed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, fantastic. Uh, where are you right now? You're s still in Santa Monica? I am. Yep. Back in California. Nice. It's, uh, I imagine, a little bit uh, warmer there than it is here. Yeah, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it wouldn't be kind. <laughs> nah, to be fair, I'm just like hunkering in. Like, uh, I've started making stews. Uh, this is my life now for the next few months is probably just the uh, autumnal foods. That sounds fabulous, actually. I yeah. wouldn't mind some more of that. We cool off. It's about 60 something Fahrenheit today. Okay. That means uh, nothing to me. But uh, no, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that to be quite cool. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I know you've got a lot to get on with. Um, actually, before we start, uh, I know I'm not sure whether you plan to have it as part of your talk to to give a bit of background about yourself. Um, I could, or you could, <laughs> whichever you well, like. I'll, I'll I'll let you uh, sort of explain to folks, I guess, when we start. Uh, okay. Might as well do it now. Uh, there's a f we're gonna probably wait a few minutes. Uh, for everyone to actually properly roll in so you know we can uh, learn a bit about Jody, her journey uh, what brings her to us uh, today yes um i have been writing my whole adult life i have an mfa in creative writing and i started editing several years ago it's a wonderful combination um writing and editing coming coming at this craft from the point of, of a writer a lifetime writer so I work for Reedsy in um, memoir and fiction, nonfiction, um, business, psychology, self-help, all kinds of um, different genres. And um, you know, I love to work with I love to work with writers. I love to developmentally edit. I like to line edit. Um, I do assessments as well. So. Um, you know, bring it on. I'm, I'm interested right now in working with manuscripts that are somewhat along the way, you know, not necessarily beginning stages. They've been, you know, well workshopped, they've been maybe assessed, maybe they've been um, seen by other editors. Um, so, you know, not beginning stages, but the things that are maybe intermediate and onward. But um, that's not always the case. Right now, that's what I'm looking for. So, right. um, yeah, that's my story. Cool. Before we start, is that a dog we hear in the background? Yeah, I'm just going to close this door. Hold on one second. <laughs> I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I just hear the uh, the shaky collar sound and got a bit excited. Okay. <laughs> yep, that was someone who just came in to visit and then left. Nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sounds... good, good here. Or they're leaving soon. Super safe. Cool. Uh, in which case, uh, I'll let you get on with it. If you need anything, I'll be here. Otherwise, I'll see you uh, at the end for the Q&A. OK, great. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm so happy to work with fellow writers. Um, I, I think memoirs in particular, are some of the, the bravest of the writers because of the very personal nature of the content. And um, you know, you're, you're mining your personal business and you are sharing it with the world, and that takes courage. Um, so, bravo. Um, I assume that I'm going to be talking to people who are interested in being published. Um, so I'll, I'll speak on that level. Although, obviously, the tips that I'll give today are good for those who are just writing on a more personal level, maybe just for the family or posterity. Um, so what I'm going to talk about are tips, suggestions, not necessarily hard rules. Maybe some are rule adjacent. <laughs> um, now and then it'll be like, oh God, don't do that, whatever you do. But you'll, you know, the more that you work in a in a genre and you learn some classic rules, you you start to get more confident and you can see where you can twist and shift and break them. But I'm going to talk about some things that I I've, I've heard that uh, publishers are looking for and that I've actually seen. I've, I've talked to agents, publishers, people with literary agencies and 
there are certain things that they just um, don't want to see in memoir. So, you know, most of all, they're looking for a good story. You know, long before I was editing memoir, I would I was reading memoir, many memoirs, not necessarily written by people I'd heard of. So what leads us to read the memoir of someone we've never heard of, we've never met? It's a really good story well told and that um, that could come from any one of us. So I say get out there and learn your craft, learn to be a good writer, learn to be a good storyteller, and you can bring the stories out of your personal life that will be interesting to other people. Um, so let's start with the first point on the list. One, what memoir is not. Memoir is not, although it's often confused with autobiography. In the eyes of publishers, um, unless you're Mick Jagger or Martin Scorsese or the Queen Mom, you probably your life probably doesn't warrant full length mem uh, autobiography, which tends to span your earliest years till the present. So for those of you, Mick, if you're here, <laughs> Martin, if you're there, go ahead and write that autobiography. Although who's kidding who, you're probably gonna hire a ghost writer. But um, think of an autobiography as the story of a life while memoir is one of many possible stories within a life. So while most of us aren't suited for autobiography, there's a memoir in every house and probably many in many in every house. So memoir is not a box of your journals tipped into a Word document and spilled onto the page and handed to the audience uh, because that's not storytelling. Uh, unless you are one of the rare few who have written in story form in your journal, that's not, that's not really what memoir is. We don't wanna just read a bunch of disconnected tales and thoughts and experiences. Um, it's also, uh, similarly, it's not a, an unlinked collection of essays. Um, unfortunately, those don't tend to sell. That broke my heart some years ago when I wanted to write a collection of essays about my early years in California. Those don't really sell unless you're David Sedaris or Mar Steve Martin or uh, Chris Rock or someone. <laughs> um, memoir is not therapy. So while you'll probably work through things, in the course of writing your memoir, we don't really want to hear the the ugly, deeply emotional, pained, gutted experiences that you're going through if you haven't made it past a traumatic situation. So if you're going through a divorce, if you've really been um, you know torn apart by a breakup, that really doesn't belong in your memoir. We're better off reading this after you've worked through it. Um, you know, Mary Carr says that the act of writing a memoir is going to gut you and exhaust you. It, she talks about, I think it was the end of Lit, when she they you know put the last period on the last page. She said she felt the fever coming up her neck. She she, she spiked at 104 degrees and she got pneumonia. <clears throat> and a lot of her uh, colleagues and friends have had similar situations because it took so much out of them. But that was you know, in the excavation and the story writing, it wasn't because she was in the heart of a divorce or or family trauma at the time. So I like to use, um, paraphrase one of the great uh, writers on the show, Succession, who said, um, why don't you just go ahead and outsource that to your therapist? So wait until you're over that trauma and looking at it less emotionally and more objectively and then, and then consider writing about something like that. Um, um, more than once in this talk, I'm going to refer to a, a couple people who I think will make great resources for you if you're not familiar with them already. One of them is um, Marianne Roach, also known as Marianne Roach Smith. She's, uh, I think, a former New York Times contributor, uh, if not currently, and she's a blogger. And she has a lot of terrific wisdom, a lot of great um, essays and blogs, including guest uh, blogs that you, I recommend that you look into. She says, memoir is something you know after something you've been through. So that's an interesting way to look at it, I think. It's it's a it's where you where you got to after that journey and you're sharing that with us. Readsy is also a great resource for writers. And um, I looked on one of their blogs and it said that memoir is a narrative written from the author's perspective about a particular facet of their own life. So <clears throat> you get the idea. It's not massive, it doesn't have to be massively spanning. 
it could be um, much more focused. Which leads me to point number two, which is deciding the scope of this memoir. So to help frame and narrow the scope of your memoir and to find the story in it, um, you could consider thinking like a fiction writer. Maybe you could craft a sentence that describes your story arc. And um, you, know, you can put that on a post-it note and stick that on the top of your computer screen and keep an eye on it. And, and you could do the same with a theme, which we'll talk about shortly. So I, a few I stole and or adapted from the internet of these possible sentences that might describe the, the overall idea of your memoir. Um, orphaned kid saves the family farm during the depression. Seems very focused. Cross-dressing teen survives high school in the 50s. Single mother puts herself through med school while raising three kids in the deep south. And one more, 55 year old man says, hell with the pension and abandons his finance career to become a gardener. So if you write that sentence and then the theme on a post-it and stick it on that computer screen, you keep it right there in front of you. You can find you're, you're not necessarily going to go off in directions that aren't serving the story that you really want to tell. And this can be, uh, this happens all the time because I think what happens is that um, I find that a lot of the writers I meet feel that they have one book in them. <laughs> and this is the only one I'm going to do and I'm putting everything in it. It's getting all my greatest hits. And to avoid that happening, you can narrow your fo focus early and then all those other great stories from your life and all those brilliant things you think as you're going for walks, you can put those in a folder and save those for another piece, but you want to stay focused on the one you're working on now. I used to I used to suggest something like this when I worked with a lot of high school and college students on essays. We would try to get the thesis statement early and put that right in front of them so that when they found themselves writing off in other directions, they'd go right back to the thesis to remind themselves what the promise was of this essay. So as far as the scope goes, um, how much time should you of your life should your memoir cover. That, of course, depends on the story you want us to hear and the theme that supports that. Maybe it starts when you graduate high school and it wraps up the day that you graduate college. Maybe it starts on your wedding day and ends up 12 years later, the day you sign divorce papers. Um, maybe it covers the 12 weeks between when you decided to try out for the first play ever and ends on opening night when you are the lead. Maybe it's only three days. Maybe you were held hostage for three days and that's the only time you want to cover in this memoir. So once you decide the story that you want to tell, it's going to more naturally tell you how long from which years and which day to which day, which year to which year go in to this manuscript. So um, yeah, so what can help you define that if you're really not sure is you could talk to the people who know you, the people who lived through that with you and ask them which aspects of that time jump out to them, which stories are most poignant. Um, yeah, so you just wanna be careful not to make it a data dump. You don't wanna throw everything into it and try to tell your every, every story. You might, again, you might have several memoirs to write. So my, my recommendation is always to choose the one that's really telling you it wants to be told and start there and keep the other information out of it, maybe for a later book. Um, okay, so number three, what is this story really about theme? I think I like to use an example of the, um, the movie Rocky when I explain this. If you ask a lot of people, what's, the, what's Rocky about? They will tell you uh, Rocky is about a fighter. Um, he was washed up. He's working in meat pecking, or he's, he falls in love with Adrian. He gets a shot at the title fight. He trains like a beast. They would tell you the plot. They would tell you what can be seen on the screen. But in story development, we treat the word about differently. It's, it's not plot, it's theme. It's what's really going on underneath what we can see. Like what's really going on with Rocky? What is Rocky all about? Rocky is about determination, self-respect, wanting, so, wanting respect from the outside. It's about second chances. This is the heart of Rocky. This is what makes it such a beloved film because it's, it, it's 
it cover it addresses themes that that resonate so much with people. We root for him because we understand what's really at the heart of what he wants and needs. Um, Mary Carr says about uh, her third memoir, Lit, that it's about leaving home to find home. She also says it's about embracing a mother, to let go of a mother, to become a mother. She let that guide the writing of that memoir. <clears throat> so going back to those, um, some of the ones that I mentioned possibilities earlier, we could, we could look at the theme that we might build into that or find in that. If it's the story of when you, um, if it covers when you left high school and it ends when you left college, maybe this memoirist is really trying to take a look at what it took to graduate summa cum laude. Maybe so that maybe that's about pushing yourself for the first time and seeing what your best effort looks like. And what's that about? That's about self-respect. That's about pride. Um, the one about the teenager in the 50s, say that this this teenager who cross dresses is trying to survive a, a, the 1950s in the United States in a high school. Maybe that the underlying about of that story is it's about learning to like who you see in the mirror. Maybe it's also about helping enlighten those who act like jerks out of their own discomfort. Um, so you, you know, you look for those deeper, more meaningful themes, and that can help you figure out what goes in this memoir because you want the stories that feed the theme that you've chosen. The one about the 55 year old who quits his career and becomes a gardener. That to me sounds like a story about taking risk, going after something you really want. And what's that about? That's about courage and staying power and uh, determination and resisting other people's fear. Because when you wanna make a big change, when you wanna do something risky, often what you hear about is what scares other people about your idea. And to me, that's an interesting idea. Um, and the one about the wedding day, um, starts on your wedding day and ends when you're getting a divorce. What's that story really about? Of course, it depends on who's writing it, but I'm throwing out possibilities. Maybe that's about living for yourself, not worrying about other people's expectations. Maybe it's about standing on your own for the first time in your 41 years. Maybe it's about independence. These are, these would, these are themes that could do a beautiful, do beautiful jobs of, of guiding memoirs. Other possible memoir themes, realizing that your parents did their best and forgiving them for it. Um, navigating romantic love without letting it take over your life. Coming of age, very common metaphor theme. And what's what's within that? Maturity, taking responsibility, opening your eyes. Um, you could write about accepting a change that you didn't really want and learning that, that you actually like it quite a bit. Um, it could be an awakening, realizing that you're the one who's been discriminating against other people. It could be about uh, the extraordinary power of hope. It could be about the power of gratitude. It could be about the power of letting go of blame. These are themes that could drive a, mem a memoir. And back to Marion Roach. She helps people figure out what their story is about by using a little template that she calls the memoir project algorithm. Um, she says it's about X as illustrated by Y to be told in a Z. So we're gonna get rid of the Z part because she's talking about a blog or a magazine article or a book. We're talking about a book, memoir. So it could sound something like this. She says, "Pick here's, here's an example of her putting content into her algorithm. It's about how closure is a myth as illustrated by making unsteady decisions to get back in touch with every old boyfriend and the curious results of that escapade. <laughs> that sounds a little like high fidelity <laughs> to me, which is a terrific story. So that would be her posted at the top of her screen. Um, here's another X and Y. It's about how having somewhat bumbling parents can create a confident, independent young adult, as illustrated by a series of solid decisions. Um, so you might want to try that. When you, if you're trying to define your, your about, about your theme, try that. So I'm telling the story of X as told through Y's. Um, and back to Reedsy uh, with more of their helpful tips. Um, they say to help you figure out your memoirs theme, tell someone your story, ask, ask someone who already knows um, what's going on in this manuscript and ask them which parts arouse their curiosity. 
see which questions they ask and what, what jumps up to them. Um, think about how you were changed by the experiences that you are talking about in this memoir. What did you learn between the starting point and the end point of these years or months that you're going to show us in the memoir? What came out of it for you? Because we want to hear about that. Another, another suggestion they offer is to um, ask yourself, why am I writing this book? That's a good one. <laughs> because memoir, another thing memoir is not is revenge. This is not a, a this is not a tool to um, stick it to somebody else uh, and make yourself look like a hero and and um, let someone else have it. That usually doesn't that usually doesn't fly very well. So um, ask yourself why why am I writing this? What do I want to say? And wander around and daydream those questions for a little bit. You might also write the major events of your life and see if there's some connection between them. And in doing that, you might find the natural beats of your story. You know, you could really take some time and do this exercise, make an outline, do some notes about, um, you know, if you, if you just know that you want to write a memoir and you really have no idea which area of your life you want to cover, you might write some of the significant events, the places you moved, who you loved, how you failed, when you got your heart broken, when you succeeded, and see which ones seem to form a theme and see if you see a pattern in your choices and that sort of thing. Um, so again, from Marion wrote, she says that all nonfiction, including memoir, is an argument, which I find interesting. That's another, looking at it this way is another way that you might be able to get to a theme. So she says, um, and to me, it sounds like another essay thesis from being in high school, but she said, life is better if you garden. And if, if that's the theme of your, th of your memoir, then that it's a really good guiding premise, because if that's the idea, you're not really going to stray too far from that without catching yourself doing so. Um, another one is, the argument is you'll feel happier and more adult the day you stop blaming your parents. If you know that that's your argument, that's going to be a really nice tight guide to keep you from going off the rails into other directions. Another one is you'll be more popular if you focus on other people. <laughs> Um, so I like that idea. It's another one. Again, when you get the time, go check out uh, some of what Marion Roach, sometimes Marion Roach Smith, she's called, is doing. And um, she's a great teacher. So I think you'll get a lot out of it at no matter what level where you are, if you're a beginner or if you're advanced. The next thing I want to talk about, number four, is writing to entertain. I don't have uh, too much to say about this, except that I just really wanted to remind people that you are writing for people who don't know you, they don't love you, they don't care if your book sells, they got their hands on the book somehow, they might have paid for it, and for that reason they want to be entertained. They want a good story. Um, so you always have to keep the reader in mind, which sounds really quite obvious, but I read manuscripts where I think the writer kind of forgot about the reader. They just go writing, 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 about things that are not particularly interesting to um, someone else. And sometimes that, that means you just went on too long about something or you're including elements that just uh, don't make for good storytelling. So remember the reader isn't overtly saying this, but they're thinking, what's in this for me? <laughs> um, I know people who will read a book all the way through, even if it's boring them senseless. Um, I don't understand this at all. <laughs> I have no patience. I think that the author owes you. You owe the author nothing. And when you are the author, you owe the reader. You must remember the audience. You can entertain your readers by making sure you stay true to your natural voice. Don't try to write like you're someone else. Don't try to write academically if you're writing a memoir. We want to hear you talk. And, and some people will ask, how do I, how do I know what my voice is? Um, well, let's first of all, let's hear your opinions. You know, say what you think. Let's hear your personality, your, your idioms, your phrasing. And, you know, for some people, it's not so natural when they're actually typing, right? When they speak to you, you're hearing their voice. So I say, well, try the exercise of literally recording yourself as you tell a friend a story from your past. Or you can just pretend you're telling it to a friend and see how that sounds. See what kind of phrasing you use. Um, you could also journal to practice hearing your voice because 
journaling is generally written for you. So you're not usually trying to put anything on or twist your sound or become someone else. So take a look at the way you, you journal, the way you communicate through journaling, and that might help you get to your natural um, voice. Um, when you're entertaining in your writing and memoir in particular, I say, don't, don't be afraid to be funny if you're funny. <laughs> um, but if you're not a comedian, you know, take it easy on the jokes. Actually, even if you are a comedian, I would take it easy on the jokes. It's not, uh, it's not sitcom. You don't have to hit those beats and make me laugh every eight seconds. Um, but humor is terrific and, you know, people love a good laugh. So if it's part of the way the the spirit of what you're writing, and you are capable of writing with humor, please, please do. Um, you will entertain when you revise to cut the fat because um, you don't want clutter. You, you don't want to use, if you can say it in eight words, don't use 12 words. That's, that's a good uh, revision exercise. So don't include details that aren't relevant to the scene, to the story that you're trying to tell. Even if they happen, that doesn't mean they belong in this sentence or in this scene. Um, and most of all, uh, you've all heard this a hundred times, the idea of show, don't tell. I think it should be revised to say show more than you're showing. There is certainly reason to tell, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Um, don't stop telling, but I think most people need help learning to do more showing. Um, you want to make on the page this experience as vivid for the reader as it was when you experienced it. And that's done with visible writing. So show the story. I love dialogue. I want to feel like I'm watching a movie when I read. Because, you know, when we're children, the books that we read come with pictures. And then that day ends and the pictures go away. And as writers, that responsibility is now on us to put the pictures in the minds of the readers. And that's done with showing actually what happens on, on the page. So keep practicing this, um, even if you're pretty good at it. I, I really like the idea of visiting um, a lot of blog posts and webinars and podcasts. I learn from these all the time. And um, keep practicing, do exercises to, to show you how to show. I also like the idea of doing a revision pass, a very targeted one. Now, when I'm hired to edit, I'm usually looking for everything in one pass. We've got a clock running and we're there's money involved and I want to catch all of it. But you, when you're working on revising your own work, hopefully you're, you're not rushed and you could, you could do a revision pass where you just look for everything, but consider doing a pass just to look for showing, to see if you're writing invisible scenes. Don't worry about commas. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about whether or not you ended a chapter well and made me want to move to the next chapter. Just focus on scenes and whether or not you are helping us to see them. You might want to go through later and do a comma pass, even though you'll bring a proofreader in for that. God, thank you, God, for giving us proofreaders. They will always be invited in at the end, not to worry. Even if you are um, a grammar expert yourself, even if you have a great editor, um, you, you always bring a proofreader in at the end. So um, because otherwise uh, I find, you know, a lot of people, for example, don't know what to do with commas. And that's rightly so. Some comma rules are fixed. Some are, um, you know, if you like it, do it that way. I used to joke that my students would, um, at the end, I could tell they just did the comma. I call it the comma shaker. <laughs> They'd look at the essay and go, oh, I know this needs commas. Let me just put some in there and then hopefully they'll land in the right place. So um, a proofreader will worry about that even if you, you do want to do your own uh, revision pass. But I really like the idea of doing a pass just to look for one thing at a time. And uh, showing is so important that that is uh, a good reason to do a pass. So uh, my last big point is um, a biggie, and it is about balancing these visible scenes I just described with something that's called reflection and then something that's called takeaway. So when I talk about reflection and takeaway, I'm going to be borrowing from the playbook of Brooke Warner, which is a publisher. Um, she and her partner in memoir things, Linda Joy Myers, do a lot of webinars and blog posts and books. Terrific, terrific resources. They really know what they're talking about when it comes to memoir. And Brooke also brings the experience of someone in publishing. She's a publisher. So what I want to do is explain what these are and then show you an example of how you might do it. You know about visible scene. That's taking us back in time 
and showing us you on the playground or you asking someone out or you at your first job. You're putting us in that scene from the point of view of you back then. Then what memoir wants is reflection. And that's where now and then, not all the time, doesn't have to follow every scene, where you as the current day adult look back on that visible scene that you just gave us and you tell us what you know now, how you see it now. And it's an internal moment that you share with us about what something meant to you now that you can see it from this new vantage point. And then <clears throat> comes the more complex takeaway. It's very interesting and it's definitely worth researching to get good at it. I'll explain that in a second. I wanted to give you an example of these three together. So um, here is a little visible scene that I'm then going to follow with a possible reflection based on that scene. So, all right, here it goes. The day after my 12th birthday, I stood in the middle of one of my parents' glorious cocktail parties, the men in trim dark suits, looking like they just followed Frank Sinatra into a casino, the women with mile high hair, blue eyeshadow and shiny white go-go boots, Cigarettes dangled from fingers and smoke swirled up in wisps to form a cloud layer at the ceiling. Ice clinked in crystal whiskey glasses and martinis glinted and gleamed as candlelight reflected in the clear liquid. My father gestured for me to come out of my partial hiding spot near the doorway to the kitchen. I felt a rush at being summoned in the midst of all that grown up glamor. I tipped my head back tall and strutted over to him expecting him to ask me to fetch him a lighter or God even wow would he ask me to refill his drink right there in front of all those glamour people. But he leaned over and said loud enough for others to hear, I just knew it. Sweetheart, don't gawk from the edge of the party. It looks strange. Why don't you join the other kids in the basement? Okay, so that's the scene. As a reader of memoir, I can feel that girl's embarrassment. But imagine now if you, as the memoirist, talk about that scene without just jumping on to another scene. A reflection about that might sound something like this. I hated when he treated me like a little girl and it happened all the time, no matter how grown up I tried to dress or speak or behave. He always made me feel like a damn child. This happened for many years afterward, well into my twenties. So obviously here it's clear that this is the memoirist later in life. I used to think he was just an insensitive lug, but as the years have passed, I've wondered if he wasn't just uncomfortable that I was growing up. His little girl was disappearing forever and he was trying to halt time by forcing a teddy bear back into her arms. So again, reflection is a moment of inner musing, giving your thoughts, your feelings, and making sense of what happened in that scene that we just read from the past. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now takeaway, this is, this language, I don't hear much out there um, or read about on the internet, except mostly when I look at Brooke, Brooke Warner and Linda Joy Meyer's content. They, they really have a handle on this terminology. Um, Brooke refers to how the publishing industry is always asking, what's the takeaway? What's the takeaway? The salespeople, the marketing people, they all want to know in this memoir, what's in it for the reader? That's really what they're going for. So you want to try to offer some of these to them. A takeaway is kind of, it's like a reflection, but it's a bigger observation. It's something that is deeper. It's maybe philosophical. It could be analytical. It explores a, a universal truth or the nature of things. Um, Brooke recommends speaking in the second person when you want to practice getting better at this. If I talk right to you, um, I can put myself in a headspace that makes me feel more philosophical and um, work through a universal concept like, you know, when you become a parent, you start to notice da 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 da. And I could switch that to I if I want, but that's a good exercise in helping you think about these, these bigger step back kind of thoughts. So for the scene that in the cocktail party, I have a little, another kind of reflection followed by a takeaway. So this is what it might sound like. So reflection, when I became a parent, my perspective on dad shifted. My God, back then I had no idea of the feelings he must have wrestled with watching his long-legged girl blossom, the girl who was always being mistaken for at least three years older than her age. And now here comes a takeaway. You can hear the shift into more philosophical concepts. 
Parenthood installs a brand new lens on the life camera and it automatically twists that lens to a laser focus. You can now see crisp, clear edges around the thoughts of the boys who look longingly at your little girl. You become able to zoom right in on the suffering of your son when the neighborhood boys run off with the football and don't look back to ask him to join them. The shutter speed adjusts, bombarding you with crystal clear images of your child's every embarrassment, every slight, every joy, every hurt, every fear. You have a baby and the lens points right into the eyes of that child and holds steady there for the rest of your life. So that's an example of what a takeaway could sound like. This passage creates a camera lens metaphor around the idea of the viewpoint of parenthood. Um, takeaway does not have to be metaphorical at all. I'm a huge fan of, of metaphor and uh, writing, so I like it. It can be overdone, so be careful. But if you're if if you're if you're not already good at metaphor, I would say that's really worth your time looking into some exercises to to incorporate some of that into your writing. But again, takeaway isn't really about it's not about metaphor, although it could be. It's um, it's your time to become a philosopher and an analyst of ideas and present those after a scene. And again, not every scene. This could become exhausting too. But it, but look at the depth that it could add to your memoir if you do this. It gives. It's, it's you digging deeper into something. It's you thinking out loud as the current day adult, and it's the, therefore giving depth to your memoir more than just this happened to me, that happened to me, this time. I'm stopping now to look back at it and see how that's significant, what I see now. So what happens when there's a meaningful nugget like this in memoir is, is you know, people might circle your passage in your book in, in pen. <laughs> Imagine the joy. Somebody marked my words in a pen. Um, maybe they the reader stops and puts the book down to think about their own thoughts and how it applies to them, because that is what takeaway is about. It's about a universal idea that makes your memoir now about me. This is what publishers eat like candy. How does this person's memoir resonate with the reader in a way that I, when I'm finished with that book, I walk away thinking about my own life. Maybe you inspired me. Maybe you look, you're making me look at things differently. That's, that's memoir magic right there. Um, and I just wanted to add something I was thinking about this morning. Um, when I was thinking about takeaway, I was thinking, here's a device that might help and make things interesting. If you want to take a run at this, you could quote someone else, someone famous. I was thinking about how one of my favorite Dylan Thomas quotations is, somebody's boring me, I think it's me. I've always loved that. And I thought, wow, you could say, say you were just writing a passage in your memoir about your boredom and, um, or your child's boredom or something about boredom. You could do a step away, do a reflection from the current day um, memoirist and then you could talk about, you know, well, Dylan Thomas said this, and really, isn't that about the responsibility we have to entertain ourselves and da, 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 da. You can use someone else's wise or inspiring words as a jumping off point. Um, you know, musicians, scientists, James Baldwin, Anais Nin. So that was my morning <laughs> inspiration that I wanted to uh, share with you. So again, look up um, reflection and takeaway when you when you get a minute, look up um, Brooke and Linda Joy's work on that. Um, my favorite example of takeaway that Brooke cites is from Cheryl Strayed Wild. And um, she talks about how she's on the Pacific Crest Trail and she thinks she's about to be stamp, um, run down by a Texas Longhorn bull and then she goes into a takeaway and it's just it's just terrific. In fact, if you have wild <laughs> in the paperback, this takeaway is on page 69. Uh, it starts near the top and goes all the way to the bottom of the page. It starts on the afternoon of the fifth day. So if you get a chance, look up or just you can find it uh, through a Brooke Warner thing. She'll she'll teach it. She'll teach it to you as well. But that's a great example of how she takes an immediate scene and then she talks more theoretically and what she, how she could see a bigger life concept in that specific moment on the trail. So uh, that is it for my big five points. Um, I have some closing thoughts that I hope Martin gives me a little time for oh, yeah. at the end. We'll hit that at the end. I just wanna bring up uh, some people's thoughts. Viola says, smack my face. You just added a new level to my memoir. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
Um, oh wow! So, Thank you. Uh, that was great. Like uh, people have been loving this. Um, yeah, it's been so useful. Um, we're about to hit the Q and A, folks. Uh, so do hit us up with any questions you have for Jody. We'll try to get through as many as we can in the time we have left. Uh, but she does have some uh, finishing thoughts at the end. One thing I'm noticing, uh, there's like, uh, I think, over 500 of us uh, in here, but only 160 likes. I don't want to be that sort of person. But, uh, we can probably get that number up a little bit, thank you. And this is like really great stuff, super useful, like so actionable um, that yeah, I've been noticing people have just found this incredibly useful. Um, mm. like one point that sort of hit home for me when you talked about writing to entertain, um, I think a lot of folks do go in with this notion that, you know, you should be writing for yourself, which I think is true, but I think people get that from the wrong angle. They sort of think I should be writing for me as an experience of writing rather than I should be writing something that I would enjoy reading. Um, right. That's, that's the difference between a journal and a memoir. Um, hmm. Go ahead and write for yourself all day in your journal, but if you want publication, <laughs> unless you're the only one who's going to buy every copy of your book, you are writing for other people. Uh, okay, I'm going to bring up uh, some questions. Uh, we've got one here from David. Uh, I've written a fictional memoir, mainly based on some life stories, but elements of fiction. Uh, at what point yes. does a novel based on real life events, uh, oh, and then it trails off, <laughs> I guess, uh, hi, David. Become, become a memoir, I guess. <laughs> I have heard this question many times. I've heard this terminology before, fictional memoir, and some of us joke that it's really just a chicken a chicken out. Uh, I don't really want to say all this is true because I'm going to get really, people are going to rake me over the coals for all these truths that I'm told. So I'll just say that not all of it's true. Um, I My understanding is that memoir, well, no, this is, this is the truth. Memoir is true. You are telling a true story. If, um, you know, there are some, and I, I there are some, memoirs that use some really interesting creative devices that might be seen as fictional. And I did um, offer this writer um, an example of this where some guy sort of, he, he imagines a dialogue that didn't really happen, but through the dialogue that he daydreamed, he works out some things that were true to him. And as long as you're honest with the reader that this is, this is like a little fantasy moment that I'm presenting within my memoir, then it's still considered memoir. But memoir is true and fiction is um, probably loaded with truth, right? We all know that fiction is based on somebody's experience and their, their journey. But if, if you wanna write a mostly true story, but it's not gonna be all true, um, then declare it as fiction and say it's been based on a true story or based on true events. Um, and then you're being honest about it because you don't wanna, you don't wanna go down the road of a million little pieces and um, some of the other ones that just really diminish the the genre by not being honest. Memoir is true. Uh, okay, we've got a question here from Retta or Rita um, asking about uh, blueprinting a memoir. I guess when a lot of like f novelists, first time novelists, they do turn to things like, I guess, The Hero's Journey, Save the Cat, that sort of thing. But I guess right. when you're dealing with a memoir, is there is there a way to start structuring it, I guess? Right, right. Um, I like this question. Um, for fiction and for memoir, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of outlining. I don't, I mean, I'm a big fan of other people <laughs> outlining. I understand that it's not really a lot of fun. A lot of us just want to start typing that really great story that we just thought of. And, and sometimes that goes well for people, but sometimes I will read an entire manuscript that just got confusing. And I say, let's just go backward now and let's try to outline from, from the beginning. Um, you know, with memoir, I, I recommend sometimes a really loose, um, casual outline. You know, I think a lot of us avoid outline because we think back to our days of essay writing and with a one and a two and an A and a B. But I really like the idea of, of limiting yourself through a blueprint or an outline. So why not, if you've come up with one of these stories or one of these themes that we talked about or the scope, within that scope, why not outline, say, 10 or 15 major events that you want to put in the story. And then within that, you could, you know, write about what, who, who does what in there and what happened. It's your own version of an outline. And um, that might be really helpful. You might just really save yourself from, from going off the rails. I, I do a lot of on my Instagram, it's all about editing editor, 
um, writing tips. And there is one on there about uh, different types of outlines, um, like a snowflake outline and a more traditional outline. And a, you know, I, I mentioned that this is fiction, but J.K. Rowling outlines so extensively that sometimes her outlines are 10,000 words because she's world building. And that's a lot of prep work, but imagine how much fun it is for her to start the actual writing when that has already been determined. And in, in doing that, you don't get lost and then you're less like, likely to quit. I guess, yeah. When, when you do have like all that outlining and you have all those details, it, it becomes, I guess, sometimes harder to know what to exclude from it. Like imagine JK Rowling has her 10,000 words, including all her details about, you know, how wizards used to poop on the floor. If you missed that one, that was a real thing that she tweeted. That was a uh, detail that didn't make it into the final manuscript. And I guess then it becomes the idea of like, this is a great story, but it doesn't quite belong in this story. Right. Like, I, I guess as soon as you've written it, it becomes precious to you and it becomes harder to, to step away from it. Right. And some people don't like outline be outlining because they think it's too constrictive and, oh gosh, now I'm going to stick to that outline and I won't be this free flowing writer, but the outline is just the starting point. It's your outline and you can change it as you like or ditch your initial idea, say, you know what, I want that out, but it's, I like it as a, as a guide. Uh, I've got a question here from Megan who asks, uh, what is your advice surrounding the legalities of writing about other people in your memoir? Do you need to get permission uh, from every person? You know what? Um, I like that question and I, I thought it might show up. So I, I printed some thoughts about that, but I suggest, you know, the, this, the information I've gotten has, uh, one of them was from a lawyer, but some of them was not from lawyers. Um, but you, you're you gonna wanna talk to um, a lawyer about this. But um, this blog that I found by um, someone named Chandler Bolt, not Chandler Bing, um, I thought this was interesting. One, um, only living people can sue you for defamation. So not someone can't file a lawsuit in the interest of another person, that's good to know. Um, and, and state cannot sue you. Um, the best defense against um, def defamation is truth, <laughs> he says. He says that um, if someone was convicted of ax murder, you can call him an ax murder, but you, you're, you're gonna get in trouble when you say, I wouldn't be surprised if my next door neighbor were an ax murder. So make sure that your facts could hold up in court. That's one of them. Um, make sure that you're clear when something's an opinion or when you're stating it as fact. Um, Mary Carr says she just lets the people in the story read it and, and give her their feedback. And it's funny because as I was researching this, I found that um, the men are ten, they're the ones who tended to go, I don't care what anybody thinks about what I wrote, screw them. And the women were more sensitive to what their mother or brother or sibling might think. In fact, asking them for their input in that way might help you remember things that you had forgotten, not that they're supposed to change the content because this is your version of how things happen. Um, but so no, you don't, you don't have to ask for permission, but it's always smart to change their names, change other identifying information, what they wear, where they lived. And some people even go as far as um, changing your name as the author, if you really wanna let it rip. Um, and if we don't know who you are, then, then you might be even safer. But the publisher is not going to save you on this. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that when you um, publish a memoir, you've signed something that says, "If this thing goes to court, it's on you," because you, you, you know, you wrote things that are um, lawsuit worthy. So um, err on the side of caution, and then put also put a disclaimer in the manuscript right at the beginning, perhaps saying that memories are imperfect, and you are recalling this to the best of your ability. Yeah. Like when it comes down to it, like I find the most compelling memoirs are the ones where people are able to reflect on their own experiences and their own behaviors. Like treating a memoir as a personal burn book of like, finally, this person will see, like everyone will see like, <laughs> right. how, how, how poorly I've uh, been treated by this person. Yeah, um, that's pretty thinly veiled. That that doesn't usually go over very well. Uh, cool, cool, cool. I'm just having a look at some of the questions here. Sorry, just give me a second. Uh, I can give you one that I heard. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it's in there, but I hear this one all the time. Um, people ask, how am I supposed to write dialogue if memoir is about truth and authenticity and you want dialogue in this thing? And boy, I really do. I love dialogue. How am I supposed to honestly represent a conversation from 15 years ago or 15 days ago? 
So the answer to that is that um, in memoir, it's the spirit of the conversation that you are bringing back. Obviously, unless you walked around with a recording device, you are not going to remember those conversations. So um, it's assumed that when I read a conversation that you wrote, that I leave that scene feeling that I really got the spirit of the conversation and the essence of what each one of you, the tone and what you two were saying overall, not, not exact uh, dialogue. Uh, cool. Some people have been asking about uh, the resources that Jody's mentioned. Uh, if you've signed up through Eventbrite, you'll get an email later uh, in the week with a link to the transcript. We'll get a transcript of her talk made, which will have everything listed with links and whatnot, so you have that. I've also just dropped it in the uh, comments in the live chat. I'll pin it to the top so you know where the link is. We're going to have uh, the transcript there, so don't worry. You haven't missed anything. You can get all that stuff there uh, later. Uh, give me a second. I found a good question here from Margareta. Uh, As a ghostwriter for my mother, is it legit to write about her version of her life? My siblings don't think so, and some even do not want me to continue. So I guess, like, uh, can you write someone else's memoir? Sure. Ghostwriters do it all the time. Um, in fact, if you're reading the, a book by someone famous, it was probably written by someone else. Um, that's what ghostwriters make their living doing. I mean, some aren't doing memoir, but autobiography, memoir, all kinds of things. So you certainly can. The, the trick there is, is writing in her voice. And that's where the, that's why the memoir ghostwriters are very, very well paid as are the editors of, of memoir. Um, so yeah, sure. If you, I don't, I don't know if you're saying that, um, that your mother's around to comment on this, that is a much more sensitive issue. And I guess I wouldn't be surprised that some siblings would um, waffle at that. Although I, I guess the distinction is, like, if you are truly being a ghostwriter, then your mother would have approval over everything that's written, I guess. Right. If you're, yeah. if you're basically writing a version of what you believe is the truth without necessarily your right. mother's approval. It, right. So it's not if, if they're writing in the voice of the mother, that's more like memoir. But you could also write, you know, a narrative nonfiction piece about your family or about your mother. And I've also seen, you know, a duplicate or dual narratives where a mother and a daughter will both speak in the memoir. So they share their, their two points of view come out um, in within the, the one book. Uh, got a question here from Mysterious MM. The main substance of my memoir happens during one year in my 20s, but I have several childhood stories that are relevant. Are those better told through flashback or can I begin a book with them? So I guess does everything um, have to be sequential? Great, great, great. I like that question. In fact, that is another thing I wanted to um, bring up if we if we're going to have time. Yeah, flashback is a, um, a device that I like in memoir and in fiction when it's really serving the piece. So don't feel that you need to put some flashback in because you know how to write flashback and you, a book should have flashback. You could write chronologically and it might just roll out beautifully that way. That's not to say that there won't be flashbacks within the chronology, but I wanted to point out um, the difference between flashback and something that's called recollection. In fact, I wrote this one out too, in case this question came up. So if you use flashback, make sure that you think there is reason to take us out of the momentum of the present scene that you have been rolling us along with. We're with you and we're going forward and now you're stopping us and taking us back in time. So make sure that that is warranted. If it is, um, a flashback is an interruption that takes us back to a visible scene. You might also just instead offer a recollection, which is where the character just stops and pauses and remembers something. They might do similar jobs, but a recollection is less intrusive. Let me give you a, a quick example of what those might sound like. A flashback example, John stared down the familiar street of his childhood and thought about how terribly he'd treated the boy who lived two doors away. When the boy had moved into the neighborhood, John watched for hours from his window as the muscular men emptied the moving vans of chairs and tables. The new boy busied himself in the front yard, quietly staging battles between two plastic dinosaurs. Irritated, John marched over to the new boy and huffed, you know, nobody wanted the Murphys to move. This is their house. They built it. The boy looked up, not letting go of either dinosaur. So that's flashback. We've been out of the present, now we're in the past. Um, if this were to be presented just as a recollection, a little pause, John stays in the present and recalls what a jerk he was. 
John thought about what a creep he'd been to Sammy, the stuttering boy from the old neighborhood. For years, he'd taunted the struggling child, and now every time he heard his own boy stutter, the staccato sounds stabbed him like rusty knife points. In that case, we don't leave the scene that we're in. He just stops and has a thought. So they, they both work, but they both do different, um, different jobs. You can also show in dialogue um, things that happened in the past without, without interrupting the, the current scene, right? You could just have two characters say, you know, God, do you remember the time we went to Maui and blah, blah, blah? And you could fill in the story that way. But don't be afraid to use flashback. Just make sure that it's warranted because you are stopping the current forward moving action when you do that. Uh, cool. All right. I'm just having uh, noticing the time and we're getting towards the end. I'm just going to have a few little bits of housekeeping uh, before we have anything final. Uh, I've dropped a link to the Readsy Live page. We're going to have a bunch of uh, webinars coming up, some of them to do with writing, a few of them to do with publishing. We even have the return of our cover critique, where if you've designed a, a cover for your book, you can submit it and have it uh, reviewed by one of our editors. Uh, sorry, not our editors, one of our designers. Uh, as always, Read Z, we are home to literally hundreds of fantastic experienced uh, editors. If you do need help with your memoir, whether it's at a fairly early stage or somewhere more advanced, um, then you might get someone like Jody uh, to help you bring it to life and move it along. Uh, just go to readsy.com, sign up for a free account, and you can see all the great people we have there. Um, as I mentioned, we will be having a transcript of this put up on the blog. That's blog.readsy.com slash live. I've posted it in the comments there. Um, you can come back to it next week and they'll have all the resources and posts and authors that uh, Jody has spoken about today. Uh, but this has been yeah, absolutely fantastic. Uh, we have uh, lovely comments. Thank you so much, Jody. Uh, thank you for that. I don't know, that's not a funny dwelling. Um, we have uh, Dr. Sandra, very useful in Imagine Clear. Uh, Laura says, thank you, Jody. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this has been really, really fantastic. Um, so before we go, uh, I know you have a couple of final thoughts. I do. How, how much time do I have? <laughs> well, you know, people, if you're, if you're tired, you can go home now, but, uh, we can spend as much time <laughs> well, okay. As it's not going to go on too long, but I just kept writing things that I wanted to, to leave with. Um, my, some of my closing advice for memoir writers, one, um, start small and um, just write a scene, write about a date that you were on or a lecture you attended or an experience in a classroom um, and practice the craft this way because it's, it's, it's so interesting to me how many people will jump into long form fiction or memoir and they haven't really practiced the craft of writing. They, maybe they took a writing class or they did well in creative writing but they haven't really practiced. So, you know, I'll, I'll say, great, you know, you're writing memoir, what, have you written short stories? Have you written dialogue? Have, and they sometimes have done nothing. They've not written, not so much as a scene or an exercise. And to me, that's like saying, you're going to go ahead and be the head caterer of the governor's ball. You're just not going to throw any dinner parties in advance of that. You're going to skip right over it. So practice and start small. Um, walk, number two, I think just walk around and daydream about your past and listen for the core story that um, wants you to let it out. Sometimes it will, it'll, it'll present itself to you if you give it a chance in, in, in enough quiet. Um, one, what we just talked about was the outline. I really do like the idea of giving an outline a chance and um, jot which tales you think you'd like to put in a story form and see if they belong together and see if they, um, if they present a theme to you. Um, you know, sh practice showing and again, if even if you consider yourself an advanced writer, um, practice your craft. Um, take a scene and see if you can show. And if you already are showing, see if you can show even more precisely with better detail and metaphor and other visibles. I want to see the, the details in there that make me feel like I know these people, that I can see these places. And then watch for where you can insert those reflections and those takeaways, because then your memoir is going to resonate with someone else, with the reader. And that's when it's going to hit them in the heart. Books sell because people tell other people about them. Word of mouth is my understanding. That's the number one way to, to get yourself a bestseller. So when you make your memoir resonate with other people, they're going to tell each other about it. A um, couple more things. Don't marry yourself to the idea of getting a traditional book deal. The odds are not good that you will get one. And 
Uh, even if you do, it might not be the walk in the park that you might have fantasized. Um, hybrid publishing is a terrific option that leans on traditional publishing, but you have more control and you also get to keep more profit. So look into some of the hybrid publishers. And of course, there's also self-publishing. So I know a lot of writers really love that idea that you'll be, you know, you'll get that pedigree of a traditional book deal and, and you and you might. But if you don't, there's there's just so many there are so many other options available. And one of the wonderful things about hybrid publishers is they don't tend to be so concerned about your platform. Traditional publishers want to know how big are you already? How many followers do you have? How famous are you? How many articles have you written? Who already knows you? And, and you know, have you done their job for them? And that's a lot of pressure. What if you're just a great writer? What if you have a magnificent story and you haven't been self-promoting? It's just that's you know, ugh, it turns my stomach the idea that we all have to make ourselves famous to be considered seriously by a, a, an industry. So keep in mind that that might not have, you might not have to go that way. Um, look, my another point that I wanna make is go into all this with your eyes open. Learn about the process of getting um, a manuscript from starting point to book. Look at the blog posts of agents and editors. Jane Friedman is one who writes um, blogs and she also hosts guest bloggers. Learn how those things work so that you don't get in front of an agent or someone in publishing and just look like a lamb. You know, you don't want that look on your face like when people told you how hot dogs are made. <laughs> you should already know when you go into the meeting so that you can ask higher level questions. So again, Jane Friedman, Brooke Warner, Marion Roach, great resources. And um, yeah, my, um, you might want to get, a, 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 someone told me recently, it was Linda Joy Myers actually talked about an accountability group. I hadn't heard of this before, but I like it a lot. If you can't get a writing workshop to be part of, she has people who, I guess they meet for a certain amount of time online, then they go off and they do their writing and then they come back and they have to talk about what they did in that writing time. So this is a group that will keep you writing. So um, yeah, and my last point is just, I'm always saying just keep writing. Um, Keep at it because um, you know if you stop writing, then the story's over. And that's that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you again so much, everyone, for being here, and I look forward to hearing from some of you. And I, I'll be happy to participate in the uh, conversation that goes on in the in the YouTube comments. Yeah. So yeah, once this is over, uh, yeah, you can drop uh, any questions or thoughts you have in the comments, which is different from this chat. Uh, and then uh, Jody might pop in over the next few days and answer some of them. Uh, but uh, that is not a legally binding offer. Uh, but thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. Jody, this is fantastic. Um, I would urge you to uh, have a look uh, through some of the comments. Uh, it's been, yeah, I think people really enjoyed this one. It's been uh, one of my favorites. Um, so oh, thank you. Yeah, so fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you again. Uh, do head over to blog.readsy.com slash live and see what we have uh, coming up next. Uh, Jody, this has been amazing. Uh, okay, yeah, stick around uh, after this. Uh, but you guys at home, thank you very much for tuning in. Do give us a like, follow us, subscribe to our channel on YouTube, uh, and I'll see you at the next one. All right, bye, everyone. Bye. bye.